etc. by Mark Time. John Fuller trimmed the sail on etc. as he cleared the Love Lighthouse at Cape Hatteras. Checking the GPS, he still had thousands of miles of hostile Atlantic waters before he reached Spain. In days of yore, Europeans embarked on desperate westward voyages to reach the warm sands of America. That day, one of their progeny set his compass eastward to escape this world. Behind him laid miles of white shores, the stars and stripes, and a stack of papers. These papers ruled his life from stem to stern. Chief of these tyrants were the divorce papers. A close second was a yellow slip bearing a diagnosis of terminal illness and its pricey medications. Various bills, diplomas, and certificates formed the foundation of John's paper life. He lost the house in the divorce and lived out of a storage unit as he awaited his impending death. The doctors told him he had a year to live at most. Astride this mountain of paperwork sat a final page, greater than all before or since. A bill of sale for a 35-foot sailboat named etc. In his younger days, he sailed competitively for the Maine Maritime Academy. As his marriage sank into the depths, he found solace in renting little five-footer sailboats on the lake at the local state park. Gliding effortlessly across the surface, John could forget the churning waters of turmoil around him. By month three of his final year, his life continued to be covered by paperwork like autumn leaves. Under the bill of sale sat the receipt for a loan he never intended to pay back, the price of etc. Taking her out on practice sorties by the shores of North Carolina, the final stages of his plan fell into place. The night before getting underway, he carefully checked the weather report. John Fuller gripped the rigging with a prolonged sigh. Etc. bobbed peacefully as it rested next to the pier. Looking over its sleek white hull, John ran his hand along the chrome railing. The stillness of midnight entwined the pair on the eve of their fateful journey. First the Caribbean, then Tenerife, then mainland Spain. John couldn't believe he was really doing it. As soon as the last mooring line laid cast off on the pier, he would finally be untethered to his Kafkaesque existence on shore. As etc. plowed into the open ocean the following morning, John ducked his head under the yardarm as he made his southerly tack towards the emerald waters of the Caribbean. To his right, the continent menaced a death by a thousand paper cuts. To his left, a thin band of islands reached toward John to keep him pinned against the land. In front, the bow jumped and cut through the briny waves towards the end of his life. Unlike the meaningless slow burn of perishing in a hospital, John Fuller would go out like an enterprising sea captain. The wind and the sea spray invigorated life within him which sat dormant for decades. At last he was free. John's soul peeked out from its shell like a hatching chick full of the promises of new life. Checking the GPS again, he found he was making good speed and maintaining a steady track. All the man-made barriers to his freedom evaporated with the morning dew as the sun rose higher. John's face was wet with spray, which concealed a growing flow of tears. Moisture from the ocean and his eyes watered the shriveled root of his soul. Suddenly, another source of water landed on his countenance. A solitary droplet from above heralded the arrival of a torrential downpour. John shielded his eyes to look towards heaven. The Atlantic marshaled her forces for a surprise attack to oppose the fateful sailor. He gripped the helm with white knuckles, struggling to grapple with the fast-setting reality of weathering the storm. He was certain the forecast reported clear skies. This freak storm threatened to upend both etc. and John's ambition of transiting the frigid waters to the east. Tacking back and forth as the winds whipped up sheets of spray, he struggled gallantly to keep her steady. At last, lightning struck the mainmast, frying the rigging and setting a small fire. He sat dumbfounded and blind as he fumbled around the deck of etc. When he regained his senses, he saw the growing inferno towards the stem. Springing into action, John cast his coat on the flames and hauled down the mainsail. Miraculously, both he and the sail survived the strike. However, etc. foundered dangerously in the strong winds. Clamoring to the stern, John pulled furiously at the cord to start the diesel engine. After a few harried yanks, he attained ignition and propulsion. Buffeted by titanic gusts, he noticed he was in present danger of being dashed on the shoal. In the adrenaline-soaked moment of decision, John Fuller curtailed his ambitions from a transatlantic voyage to simply keeping etc. off the rocks. He took the rudder in hand and drove directly into the wind. 
The diesel engine groaned tremendously while fighting back the forces dragging John back to his fate. He twisted and wrung the throttle like a soaked rag in a desperate attempt to make headway. Looking at the billowing dark sea, John's heart sank with the realization that he was making exactly zero knots. Neither advancing nor retreating, etc. remained locked into an equal struggle between the engine and the wind. John continued to clutch the throttle like a lifeline as the seconds and minutes drifted under the keel. He checked his surviving equipment and found that the only electronic device still functioning was his VHF radio. Sitting at the lower corner of the plastic sat a small red button marked M for Mayday. Pressing it would alert the vessels in the area that he was in need of immediate rescue. John put this thought out of his mind as he battled the elements. As the wind whipped and chafed around him, he at last saw a small amount of progress. First one knot, then three, etc. heaved forward. John let out a raucous cheer as the land behind him edged away. In tandem with this cheer, the last drops of diesel poured out of the fuel line. The engine lurched, sputtered, and then unceremoniously died. John gave way to a despairing scream. Drifting towards the breakers, he coped with his situation. He figured he could still return to land, avoid his creditors, repair his ship, and get back out onto the water before his terminal year was through. He reluctantly accepted this backup plan and dialed the distress signal. After a short while of listless drifting, a Navy salvage vessel hove in view. John waved his arms in depressed surrender to the forces pulling him back to the land. At least he could try again after the repairs. Welcomed on board the Navy vessel, John watched impassively as they lashed etc. down with the towing line. He noticed a worried look from the captain. After some hushed conversation, he informed John that the towing lines were intended for a large container ship and were too heavy for the sailboat. The rescuing vessel had no other lines aboard. Ignoring their warnings of the dangers it posed to his boat, John demanded that they make an attempt to bring etc. back. Otherwise, she would suffer the ignominious fate of being dashed on the rocks. Shrugging his shoulders, the captain assented to John's wishes. The Navy vessel heaved about and set its course back to land. Without a sufficient catenary bend, the heavy towing line shook and tore at etc. pristine hull until the fiberglass showed significant fissures. First the front towing cleat snapped. Next the sailboat turned sideways and buffeted against the choppy seas. The captain informed John that etc. would not make the journey intact. The defeated sailor demanded that they continue on. The sailboat was more like a lifeboat off the sinking ship of his life. Concerned for the safety of navigation and crew, the captain overrode John. Sending out a message to the surrounding vessels, he declared etc. a hazard to navigation. In ten minutes, he would commence sinking the vessel. John cried out in terror as he heard the words pass over the captain's lips. Rushing to the forecastle, he saw several sailors loading up a 50 caliber machine gun. The captain stood on the bridge wing, overlooking the scene with grim understanding. The sailors bristled at John's advance, but the captain motioned for them to stand down. At the end of his tirade, John took in the mournful scene of etc. It was heeled over, nearly to the point of capsizing, as it dragged along under the heavy steel cable. The formerly proud and beautiful hull limped onwards like a mangled dog after its owner. The Navy vessel made proper arrangements to decouple the ship from its tow and circled etc. like a shark. Their haggard passenger made grave threats and entreaties to save his boat, but to no avail. At last, the captain descended to the forecastle as the sailors trained the dual barrels of the machine gun on John's most prized possession. The gunnery officer asked permission from the captain to fire. Hesitating for a moment, he closed his eyes and clenched his jaw. Motioning to John, the captain instructed him to stand on the firing platform. The sailors gave each other concerned looks, but acquiesced to the officer's demands to step away from the gun. A glimmer of hope turned to black despair as John realized what the captain wanted him to do. He gripped the weapon's controls with trembling fingers as his thumbs drifted to the trigger. John saw his escape from the mountain of paperwork writhing in agony through the sights. Etc. fought to stay afloat like a wounded animal, but floated helplessly towards the rocks. John turned a tearful eye towards the captain. Pursing his lips, the officer nodded with assurance and empathy. Between giving Etc. a hero's death or letting her be eaten by the land, 
the choice was clear. John increased the pressure on the trigger until a thunderous burst tore across the stormy seas. Only one of the six bullets found their mark. The rest caused large geysers of water to shoot up next to its center. John took a brief pause to pay respects to his sinking dream, then let out a prolonged hail of fire. As the hot lead slung downrange, each shot carried his troubles away. With a blank mind, he kept his thumbs planted on the trigger until the belt ran dry. When the smoke cleared, etc., was nowhere to be found. The sailors hooted and hollered at the carnage, but the captain chastised them to keep quiet. Standing up straight, the officer demanded that they engage in a moment of silence. In the cool, stark silence of the sea, John looked with blissful detachment at the billowing cauldron where etc. once was. Some wreckage floated on top like a transient grave marker of his escape. The navy vessel would bear him back to his captors and the tyrannical stack of papers. This thought failed to trouble John. He had striven valiantly against the tide, out from under the thumb of his nightmare. For a brief few hours, John was utterly and totally free. In that ephemeral ecstatic state, he lived more than all of his years of paper existence. When they pulled into port, John Fuller stepped ashore to face the consequences of his breakout attempt. The creditors, lawyers, doctors, and bureaucrats awaited to receive their pound of flesh. The faceless monstrosity which ruled his life on a throne of paperwork seemed less frightening to John now. He lifted his eyes to heaven as he strode confidently down the gangway. They would take his money, possessions, even his life. But they would never gain his soul, his spirit, those precious hours of freedom, etc.